we just feel grateful. Um, being business owners is one of the toughest things I've ever ventured into in my life. Um, coming from an academic background and taking that step into becoming an entrepreneur, which I don't even know if it feels weird to call myself that. <laughs> um, be a business owner has been, oh, so many highs, so many lows. Um, but that passion, that gratefulness, that seeing people enjoy what you created is, I think, what keeps me going even when I'm in tears or screaming or <laughs> going, what did we do? <laughs> I'm Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where we amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 203 of the podcast today. This week on the podcast, I got to go out into the community and shoot on site or record on site at Roca Climbing and Fitness out in Northwest Rochester. So I had a great, very safe conversation with Karen and Jeremy Shar out in their climbing facility. Uh, with, with social distance maintained, everybody had masks on, which I think you'll be able to hear a little bit in the conversation uh, today. So we had a really great conversation on the podcast today with Karen and Jeremy about how they originally got interested in climbing, how that transitioned from a hobby into a business. And I think throughout this conversation today, you can really hear how passionate they are about what they're doing, about climbing and about community, and understand ways that they're giving back to the community here in Rochester. I think this is also a really important podcast and conversation to hear right now because Roca and businesses like them are some of the hardest that have been hit in the pandemic. A lot of the times we're thinking about restaurants and bars, but Roca and other businesses like it are classified as fitness. So by the end of 2020, they will have been closed to the public for at least four months. They were closed for several weeks at the very beginning of the pandemic, and when I went to visit them, they were also in, a, in the middle of a state-mandated closure of their facility. They're hoping to open again on December 19th in a safe manner to the public, but if that's going to be able to happen right now, it's unclear what the state will decide. So I think this is a really important dis discussion for everyone to hear today. So I encourage you all to really listen in to the end to understand how small business is being affected during this time and why your support is so critical. So a reminder to you all that Rochester Rising and this podcast is part of the storytelling arm of Collider. Collider is a Rochester-based nonprofit that supports early stage entrepreneurs. You can find out more about Collider and services provided through that organization at Collider.mn. And we at Rochester Rising put out a brand new podcast every Wednesday. You can find it on our website at rochesterrising.org. You can also find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, really wherever you listen in to podcast content. We also have our own uh, YouTube channel and a playlist just for our podcasts on YouTube. So I encourage you all to tune in there if you really love YouTube and like to listen in on YouTube. And we premiere our latest podcast every Wednesday at noon. So you can listen in while you're eating your lunch. The perfect way to spend 30 to 40 minutes learning more about the business community here in Rochester. All right, so now on to the podcast today with Karen and Jeremy Shar of Roca. I was born and raised here in Rochester. I uh, lived here my whole life. Uh, I went away to college for just a little bit to um, Fort Collins, Colorado, to CSU. Uh, just for a semester, uh, decided to come back to Rochester to figure out something else to do. Um, and during that time, uh, I had friends that were starting a, new, uh, a different climbing gym in town back in 1998. And I got hooked up with them and uh, became one of the owners of that place. Did that till about 2004 or five ish. And then, uh, left, had some, you know, differences with my partner at the time and decided to leave and, uh, went long haul trucking for 10 years, <laughs> went all over the country, all 48 States, 
Um, and during that time, Karen and I had uh, got married, started a family, and um, it was we decided it was time for me to get off the road and get back home so I could help with the kids and stuff. And well, I wanted to be home anyway. And uh, so we looked at lots of different things and uh, landed on opening up a climbing gym. And so five years later, here we are, or a lot more than that, yeah. actually, about <laughs> uh, probably nine yeah, years later, years. here we are. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and huh. we had met uh, just yeah. before um, I had left my other climbing gym here in town, uh, shortly just before I had left there, uh, we had met, because mm-hmm. you were in town for other reasons. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I'm actually originally from uh, north of Chicago. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I came up to Minnesota to go to college. Um, I went to Gustavus and got my degree in um, health and phy ed. So I was a teacher. Um, decided I didn't really quite want to do that and moved back home to Chicago right after I graduated um, and started working in fitness centers um, and really liked the personal training aspect, really liked the fitness side. Um, of kind of my background and wanting to work individually with people. Um, So I did that for a while, um, but ended up thinking I wanted to get into the medical field um, from there. And so a couple moves later, I ended up in Rochester, um, and that was probably around 2004. Um, I had graduated college in 2000, so a little gap there. And um, in that meantime, though, between graduating college and coming to Rochester, I had found friends who had started climbing and so I kind of got a a little bit of a bug of climbing um, in that phase but kind of moved around the country exploring that a little bit and then came here to work at Mayo thought or I was thinking I was going to be a nurse Um, figured out that wasn't for my me either and uh, ended up meeting Jeremy at his climbing gym uh, to find friends try to find uh, kind of a social group in town and kind of fell in love with it again, um, indoor climbing where I was outdoor climbing before, and ended up not doing the nursing thing, but found that I really continued to like health and medical fields and that kind of thing, and went and got my master's in public health at the U of M and worked for the county for about 10 years. Um, And I was a public health educator over there. Really, really enjoyed my job, loved being connected to the community. I worked with a lot of nonprofits, a lot of different groups in town, schools. I just got to work with a wide range of people and and absolutely found that was a big love of mine. Um, Like Jeremy said, we got married, (laughs) thought about having kids, then had two kids and said, hey, we really want to change in our life. And um, we know that our passion is climbing. Obviously it's his, it was mine. And, you know, I said, you miss it. I really miss that kind of fire you had behind you when you were um, climbing a lot and working at the other gym and so um, yeah we said this we're gonna go for it and uh, we ended up probably spending about two three years figuring out the whole thing um, three years at least about, yeah. yeah three years three trying half, to yeah. figure out how we wanted to have the business run how we wanted to have the ownership be how much of the business we wanted to own in terms of the building, the land, running the business, that kind of thing. So it took quite a while to kind of get all that in place. And then finally we opened, this is our fifth year in business now. So it's our anniversary on the 15th. December 15th December. will be our five-year anniversary. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's maybe not the celebration we want to have in terms Being closed, of yeah, we are, unfortunately. Yeah. It's okay. We'll still we'll be able to we'll celebrate make it. somehow. Yeah, we'll have to live in the moment, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> take it for what it is, but. Yeah. You know, I think um, when you said, you know, you guys were getting ready to have a family and, you know, looking for something different in your lives, mm-hmm. I think it's so funny because a lot of people would think, oh, I want, like, a really steady job, but, like, I'm going to go into our own thing. Yeah. It, Why it's funny. The biggest risk in our life. The last, yeah, the last <laughs> few years looking back and it, like seeing just pictures of building the place and we've got uh, like a one-year-old and a three-year-old and yeah. we're like, what the heck were we thinking? Like, yeah. We made it obviously, mm. but it was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe we sure made that decision to do that, but it worked out. would ask me to yeah. recommend doing it that way, yeah. I don't know if I would. I'd say you can do it. 
you certainly can do it. We did it. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's hard. There's no question about it. It was a big struggle. It still can be a big struggle. So, but we're here. Yeah. So. so what do they think about what, what you're doing? Do they, do they see a role for themselves? They help out? Um, I don't know. They, they, since they were kind of grew up with this as their lifestyle, it's, it's kind of like, eh, you know, like they come in and they run into the office and they play video games, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not like, Oh, my parents own a climbing gym or we own a climbing gym or, and I go climbing all the time. Uh, it wasn't until just recently that yeah, they, they started, started really actually liking here. it. And, yeah. uh, just, oh, just this last week was their first time they made it to the top of the wall, yeah. which was a big accomplishment for them. Uh-huh. Um, they made it, up here. Uh, it was on mm-hmm. one of the easier walls just around the corner, but... Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little impressive, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd make it go higher than my head, and then... <laughs> <laughs> I'd not like uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, Our oldest is a little nervous. He's a little more heights. timid. He's, yeah, yeah um, he, he thinks things through before he does anything, <laughs> <laughs> so... But it, it's fun. It's different for everybody. Yeah. You, know, you get kids in here that, you know, we have had members as young as two and a half that love going to the top of the wall, you know, a hundred times while they're here. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we have older kids that are just don't really feel like going that high, which is OK. Mm-hmm. The nice thing about climbing is you start at the bottom and you go as high as you feel comfortable and you can still feel like you're involved. And, and then you have your personal goals and all that stuff. So um, and then coming up with um or being at a climbing gym earlier in my life, you know, watching kids come into the gym or parents of, or kids of parents that were into climbing and see those parents like just push too hard on their kids to be a climber too is oftentimes it didn't work out. So with our kids, I specifically made a point to kind of let them find it at their own pace and not really necessarily push hard into it because, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years um, since I was 10 and it's everything I do. And the only thing I've really, really been into and we go on trips, we go on climbing trips and stuff like that. So we kind of had to change our mentality with the kids. We didn't want to call them climbing trips anymore. There were more adventure trips that maybe had some climbing on them. So mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. just, yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, climbing is really more like a whole lifestyle. It's, mm-hmm. you know, informs everything you do. So when you go on trips, it's yeah, you're climbing, but you're, you're camping in, you know, irregular places. You're, you know, you're kind of going off the beaten path a lot of the time. So it's, we really wanted to convey more of that adventure side of climbing versus the climbing, climbing part of it, you know. You guys talked about this a little bit about how you got into climbing. Can you talk about, you know, how did that transition from hobby to then business? And what was kind of that process like for you guys? What were the decisions you were making, discussions, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff? Well, you you had so, a lot of the experience. Yeah, back when I was gym. back when I was mm-hmm. eighteen, uh, I started climbing at an odd age. Back when I started at ten years old, um, most of the climbing world was twenty somethings and thirty somethings. It was when it was not very mainstream in sport. It was kind of a fringe sport. It was uh, limited to you know. Uh, college or after college or young adults that had the time to go do weird things like that um so me getting into it at such a young age and then staying and finding a community like all of my friends uh back then in the 90s were you know 10 15 20 years older than I am so it it was a little strange back then hanging out uh and being that kid in that situation but then um when my friends were going to start that climbing gym uh at first they offered me to, you know, work there and, uh, full time and everything. And then, uh, they offer, offered me to buy into the business. So it was kind of a process that was already started. And, uh, I had just decided that what I was going to college for wasn't really necessarily what I wanted to do. So I was kind of looking for a new direction at that time anyway. And I was like, well, I love climbing and, you know, I get to be at a climbing gym every day. This is super cool. And, uh, being an owner there, uh, for six years, Um, you know, really seeing the whole process and the business and being in charge of a lot of that at very young age, which was another odd thing. Um, And then also at that time, too, we uh, built climbing walls for other people, mostly smaller facilities uh, like YMCAs and colleges and things like that. Um, So I was doing that at the same time as uh, running the gym and things like that. 
so I had a lot of experience early on in my life um, to then come back to that later on it was an easier decision I think versus starting from scratch saying like we're going to create this whole business we're going to do all these things that and have never having done it before and you know having that past experience with it it was obviously easier to see the the benefits to that side or knowing that we could you know follow through with it Uh, also uh talking with uh banks showing them that that experience made them feel a lot better too because we we did have to go to many many banks in order to find a bank that was willing to see our vision and help us out with it so yeah that was probably one of the longer pieces of starting the business was um making the connections in the community finding people that um understood our passion and the vision and putting together that business plan that would make sense to more people because it's not a typical business you would see um you know very often and so having to try and connect within our industry and within the just the context that Jeremy had had from so many years back being a part of of um of that company and so it was <clears throat> it was really about connecting and that's where I that's a lot of what I love to do and that's where kind of my strength in the background came from is just finding people that would support us finding people that would from the moment we'd open they'd be like well we're excited about this we want to come or to be able to invite them and seeing those connections made I think was really helpful and needed yeah and then uh, another really important thing since we decided we wanted to pretty much own and build this place by ourselves as much as possible um when you see your business or your whatever you're trying to start that way you you need to draw on every resource you have Mm -hmm. and you know my past years of uh being in construction here in town i had so many construction contacts with suppliers and builders and um then also um just the you know growing up in this community Mm -hmm. um having you know a lifetime of connections here also the support structure with my having my parents you know live here you know for watching our young young children Mm -hmm. uh while we're pretty much spending every moment we have building the place and getting it going that was huge for us um and yeah just the the size of the town was perfect for uh, you know our vision and something we could pull off or and but still maintain as much ownership as possible um yeah you gotta when you think of starting a business it's it's not just a business you're starting you gotta think of all the things that surround it all the resources it takes to get that going and being um you know having the connections we did here we this was the place that made the most sense for us because for a while we were look i mean with the industry was just really starting to take off um you know and when we decided to make this decision like early um like 2011 12 13 the, the industry was really starting to take a turn and get uh, more mainstream mm-hmm. and so we were kind of thinking like oh let's get off the road and looked at the map of the country and we're like man we could go anywhere because there's so many large markets that didn't have a climbing gym we could we're like oh we could do this anywhere but then you start thinking through all of the steps of actually making that happen we're like well you know since i was actually going to build it myself all my contacts for construction were all here it would be mm-hmm. much easier to do here our young family needs to be watched while we're doing this mm-hmm. my parents are here so we won't have I that i was still working she was i was pretty much supporting us with my job um so that was important to make sure yeah, we still have some income coming in <laughs> during that whole process it's a long time so yeah because from when i ended my long haul trucking till we opened the doors was at least three years or more yeah. so yeah. it was just, it was just so the I was one just income working yeah, yeah. I remember when we first met probably two years ago i think you were still working yep i was working at public health i was trying to do do both <laughs> and raise some kids <laughs> now we're both here yeah we were uh-huh. originally it was kind of like a five-year plan mm-hmm. we thought you know mm-hmm. we'd build the business big enough to be able to support both of us here um but it took off and did so well so quick that we're like we need you over here quicker yeah. than that and i think it was only two years before you were over here full-time so yeah. it's it's hard to balance that for me you're just like burning both ends of the candle and you're it was enough. I couldn't. I couldn't keep it up anymore. So yeah, I totally get that. I've <clears throat> tried done all those things before, trying to do all these things on the side, mm-hmm. you know, just to have some income, and it gets to be 
Yeah. Yeah. Which is even be healthy. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I definitely put your back against the wall, which you've got to Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I guess we take a step back, too. You know, can you talk a little bit about what is Ropa? You know, what, what experience do you want people to have here? What can they do here? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very broad question. Um, we have a really broad audience, too, yeah. though, so that's kind of the, that's, the cool thing about it, but it's a challenging piece of the business, too. You have a lot of, a lot of different people that come through our doors, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, recently, I mean, with all the shutdown stuff, we've, we've gotten a few grants to help with mm-hmm. marketing and redoing our website and stuff, so mm-hmm. we've been going through a lot of that with uh, some you know, third-party people helping us. and. Often they start with, well, who's your market? Who, you know, who are you trying to target? And it's like, well, anyone from two and a half till our oldest member is uh, turning 80, 80 in a couple of days. Sure yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and that's it's part of the beauty of what this business model is, is it's, it's for everybody. It's for kids, it's for adults, it's for, you know, single young adults, it's for families, it's for uh, people that want yoga, it's... It's so broad that, um, mm-hmm. and we have so many different ways to experience the place that I think it's the strength of what we're doing here is um, is mm-hmm. the strength. But then also, you know, how the do we challenge. convey that to people yeah. of just come check it out? It's yeah. um, I mean, obviously, our main thing is rock climbing, um, mm-hmm. indoor rock climbing. Uh, we have you know walls up to forty eight feet tall. <laughs> all different shapes and sizes and ability levels. Um, We have things that are very, very easy. We wanted this, I designed the facility to be very beginner friendly. I mean, we live in the Midwest. We don't have a lot of rocks. We don't have a lot of rock climbers as part of our culture like you would out in say Colorado or out West where it's more of a normal thing where, you know, high schools have teams and they compete, you know, and uh, and climbing competitions is, you know, one of their sports that they do. You can letter in it, things like that. Uh, in the Midwest, you, you kind of have to, we're at the stage of, we have to create a lot of our climbers, you know. Um, and so making the barriers to coming in and tr- just trying climbing in general, we, we try to make it as easy as possible mm-hmm. uh, by having a lot of easy terrain to climb. Um, using uh, auto belays, uh, we have a... <coughs> Uh, a lot of devices that where you can just clip in and you climb as much as you want and if you fall or let go it just lowers you down um we I, i've talked to the company that sells these things and we have probably way more than the average gym does um we have almost 30 of them in our facility and for a facility of the size that's kind of unheard of but um for us it works really well because we take people brand new that have never done this off the street uh, we have orientation video and they're able to walk in and, and climb and have a lot of fun and we found that the more people we can expose to just trying it and make it as easy as possible to try the the more people are like wow this is a really cool thing i never thought for sure this would ever be for me i mean mm-hmm. we've had so many people that you know we had that same comment like wow i never thought this would be so fun mm-hmm. or I, yeah, never, they, I never pictured myself as a rock climber, but I no, guess... No, because they thought, oh, it's a one, one time, we'll just go t- just do it once. <laughs> and some people are like, almost, and we've had so many people that have come tried it once, they're back at the counter going, how do I sign up? <laughs> what do I need for equipment? <laughs> how do I do this? Um, and they just, it's, it catches them really quick. And so that's what's, I think, really kind of unique and cool about the sport. Um, yeah, it's it, also very accessible. We've made it accessible for people with lots of different abilities too. And so um, I think that um, helps just people feel more comfortable. Like, wow, I, you know, I, I'm not an athlete or, you know, I, I don't know how to do this or I'm not flexible or I, you know, I don't know if my legs, my arms are strong enough and, or for even people that, you know, just, they haven't even tried something like this before. They just feel like they can come in and once they see it or try it, they're like, I didn't think I could do that. <laughs> That's really cool. So Yeah, I mean we get a lot of people in their first time like, oh, we just thought we'd do it for fun on a whim kind of thing mm-hmm. and like end up just really enjoying it. Yeah. Or you get kind of the fitness side of people coming in that just like, oh, I was looking for a, a more of a fun workout and they come in and it's yeah, you're getting a great workout, but then there's an awesome community here too of people that are all challenging each other and rooting each other on and it's yeah, it's just it's way different than I think a lot of um 
other facilities or people's expectations and they once they see it and they try it and come a few times and really realize hey, this is a really cool thing I never imagined it would be so fun or whatever you know so yeah super social yeah yeah um yeah, kids, adults, it doesn't matter. We have rock climbing teams here for uh, your youth rock climbing teams. Um, before the shutdown uh, this last spring or uh, winter, I guess, um, we have like 65 kids on all of our different teams. We have we have five different teams going. Um, and for them, like a lot of the parents are like, this is the only thing that gets them motivated to do anything all week long or uh, a lot of the older kids you get some high school kids where you know this is their social group this is where they hang out Mm -hmm. sometimes they'll come in not even climb they're just here to hang out um, Mm -hmm. with their friends Um, and adults too I mean it's 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 a great environment to come in in a positive environment Um, you know everybody's working out everybody's having fun everybody's cheering for each other that's the nice thing about climbing is it's it's not. It's an individual sport, but you're not really, you know, competing against other people. It's about competing against yourself and trying to do better than what you did last time. And so um, everybody's on the same side, and so it's a super positive uh, vibe and environment, and it, mm-hmm. helping each other out and collaborating. And it, it's just. Yeah. I mean, just people meet their together. best friends here. Yeah, there's yeah. people that just. I mean, that's how we met Jeremy. <laughs> Is I yeah. walked into the gym and I'm like hello (laughs) I want to meet people I want to do this activity and would go there alone and sometimes we'd chat or you know talk about going on a trip or something like that so it's really I've met a lot of people that way um so and I we hear that a lot here too so I met met a great group of friends here or Mm -hmm. you know they move away and still contact us say oh we miss it We'll see on social media people that are off somewhere else still commenting on our posts, like, oh, I miss you guys. <laughs> yeah, or taking pictures with our T-shirts on and cool places and so yeah, yeah, we're thinking of you. And it's nice. Wherever, it's yeah. It's cool. I like that. So you guys talk about how, what was your process like to find this location in Rochester? Oh, it boy. It sounds like the whole thing was construction, <laughs> so you built the whole... Was yeah. the building here? Or? So we had a, a contractor do the building, okay. the actual building. I designed the size and the layout and everything, um, but I built the actual climbing walls because um, that's a fairly unique skill. There's, I don't know, probably seven or eight companies in the world that do that. Um, luckily, I have the skills to do it myself, um, which was a huge part of getting it going because to be able to build something that like this myself, we can literally do it for half of what it would cost to have a, you know, professional builder to come in. I mean, it follow all the same standards and everything. It meets all the same, you know, industry standards for safety and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it allowed us to cr- probably create a much larger facility than we could have afforded if we had to hire all of this done. Um, and at first when we were designing it, I was feeling like, Oh man, this we're kind of making it bigger than we need, but it's okay because I can, you know, because we can afford it because we're doing it ourselves. Um, but we quickly, we're feeling the pinch of space. We're like, yeah, man, we could we could, we could use a we could, <laughs> we could use a larger facility. Yeah. So, uh, but physically, this location we actually had looked at uh, another location out on 14 West uh, towards mm-hmm. Byron. Uh, there's a spot. Um, at the end of the cul-de-sac on the south side of the road uh, next to... Um, it's just west of West Circle Drive. Yeah. Aww. West, Just west of Thomas Tool and stuff, right on the highway. It's like yeah, the cul de There's a, the, the bread place, the... Uh, yeah. Great Hearth. Country Hearth, Hearth or something Country like Hearth. that, or yeah. UBC. Anyway, it's right at the end of that, kind of below the houses. It's where that, um, that um, commercial area kind of ends Mm -hmm. and it was a really cool location that kind of had natural walls behind it and it was a bigger location or a bigger uh, land uh, spot Uh, we had it all set up we had the financing ready it was all it came down to uh, just the appraisal of the proposal or the proposed project had to just get done and signed or whatever and we were ready to break ground and and last minute we were actually out west at our industry conference um, and we got the news that the appraisal came back, and it was horrible. <laughs> uh, it just so then it, everything killed our project, killed the whole thing. 
And so we basically had to start over. We started talking to new banks again, looking for different locations. Um, we knew we wanted a, a very visible um, location. Um, obviously, uh, here on Highway 52 is very nice. When we first looked at this uh, little business park here, um, it was before 65th Street had exits off of 52. Um, in the original plan for all of the expansion of 52, they they showed exits here, but the last minute they decided not to do exits here because they felt it was too close to 55th Street to have an exit and an on ramp right, mm -hmm. you know, within each other. Um, but then I think with Menards wanting to move out here, they got the state to change their mind and put in exits yeah. here on 65th. So then after that had fallen through over on 14, then we took another look at this location again and uh, decided that it was it was going to work since there was a little bit easier access than there was before mm -hmm. so um come across this location quickly after that yeah I mean, yeah we, we had kinda... our, our real estate agent we had known for a while he sold us our house and he was also in commercial real estate and so he had always been looking he's just trying to figure out okay, keeping his eye out mm. yeah where can we find you guys space and as soon as that fell through He's like, I'm on it. Let, I, let me find something else for yeah. you guys. He and just he, felt so bad. So Yeah, and he said, well, <clears throat> you know, we looked at that, you know, the Rome Circle Business Park here before, but now there's exit. So yeah. Could be, yeah, yeah, it was huge, and that was the decider for us. And um, I think we snuck in and got this piece, Yeah, because Pulver um, they had, had only wanted a half a lot, mm -hmm. and so they bought one and a half, and we bought the other half of that lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they, we found out that this was available because we didn't need all of that land and we couldn't really afford it the way it was divided up. Mm -hmm. But buying half a chunk worked for us and the price was right. And so we made the deal and, and they made it happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 And then it, we, we find all the time people just come in and they're like, man, I drive by your building like so many times. I just had to come see and look <laughs> what the heck is in there. Um, and then after I designed that banner that we have on the north side of the building, people love that. Um, yeah. We've had yeah, yeah that design with the uh, Minnesota yeah. and the, the climber on it. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of families tell us like, oh, we know we're at home in Rochester when we see the big Roca sign, and so it makes us feel good that we're yeah. We're, so you made it to the yeah. 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 <laughs> we're, yeah. Yeah. We're we're part of the the culture here. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the seeing the need be yeah. much larger than what we the, had imagined. The um, need, and yeah, we've, um, well, we can talk about our nonprofit too. Yeah, um, well, yeah, first, so back when I was at my other gym, um, we did work here and there with um, people with different disabilities that makes it harder for uh, kind of a typical rock climbing session to happen. So there's, ways we can modify the, either the equipment or how we do things to make it possible for, you know, somebody missing a limb or somebody wheelchair bound or, you know, pretty limited mobility, mm -hmm. uh, still participate and be a part of what we're doing here. And so that was always part of the vision when we, uh, we're going to open this place and how I designed some certain features in here to make that happen much easier. And so after we got open and kind of running, we're like, um, I don't know if we even, we even had to go find people. I think it, people started asking, like, oh, well, yeah. you know, we have this group. Can we come in and, try, and try it? And we're like, oh, yeah, definitely. So um, at first we were kind of doing a lot of these things in kind, um, either with, you know, people with uh, making it more accessible for them or uh, at-risk youth or a lot of those. Yeah. That was a big connection that I had from working at public health. I had a lot of connections with the schools, with the alternative schools, with the shelter in town for kids, um, and just different organizations that worked with kids who maybe financially weren't able to experience some of the, you know, sports or activities or things in town. And so um, that was a big piece that I wanted to bring to the, the gym was to connect um, and for anyone to be able to come and try and have that experience and so um kind of I sort of fast forward through the five years but we have been able to well, you, have well, some scholarship <laughs> funds we've been able to kind of work with different organizations on uh bringing people in well when we started to see that need we were like oh, great this is the part where we can give back to the community and mm -hmm. um 
and do our part to be a good, you know, steward in the community for um, everybody. And so we're helping more people, more groups, and the, that that part of what we were doing kept growing and growing. Word got out like, hey, you know, Roka's a cool place to go, you know, for anybody. And so we were, kept getting contacted by more and more groups, and um, we just saw that it was growing so large that I think to do it all just on our own, you know, goodwill or whatever, that was becoming a bit much for us. So we started a nonprofit, uh, Thrive Through Movement, that would kind of run alongside what we're doing here because then we could, you know, write for grants or look for other types of funding to help get more groups in here because we didn't want the, you know, just our donation of time and money to limit how often people could come in because, we, I mean, you get people like that in here and it's just they've never been able to experience anything like this. They never even imagined themselves being, you know, 40 feet up in the air on a wall and when they're, you know, wheelchair bound or, or at risk youth that only see and not a very positive outlook to their life. And, uh, um, for them to come in here and have such a, an, a positive environment, it, it's for some people, it's life changing. And to see those people have such a big change in their life, you don't, you hate to, say like oh i'll see you next year when you know it's around the same time when we can you know fit you in or something like that so we thought if we could start a nonprofit where we could get some more funding to help out with getting those groups in more more often or reach a a wider um audience or demographic or um even geographic area to help Mm -hmm. people just come have fun you know yes it's right now mainly focused on um, patients and survivors of breast cancer. Okay, um, yep. Yeah, so again, when we first opened, we just met a, an array of different people and people from different parts of our community. And um, one one gal in particular came asking if we could do some private lessons for her, um, who was um, had that diagnosis of breast cancer. And so um, at the time, our yoga program was, you know, a couple classes. We were just growing it. And um, our manager at the time was like, I would love to to work with this gal. And, you know, how can we do this? How can I learn more so that I know I can work with her safely? And so we ended up going and getting some training. So um, in, as a cancer exercise specialist, so both my manager at the time and myself went and and learned more about how we could work with people who are going through that um, because it is, you you have to be definitely aware of um, limitations, things that are okay to do and things that are not okay to do. Um, And we we wanted it to be a very positive experience for her. And it really was. She was just so thankful for the space and the opportunity and a place to just feel comfortable with herself and, and feel progress and feel just feel good about herself. And so she, said, can I, can I share? Can I, I have now this new community of people I know that are going through the same thing I am. I found such benefit here. Can I share that? Would you guys be willing to have this be, you know, more of a class for others? And there's, and she's like, there's a need out there. <laughs> there's, there's a need for this. And, and I would love to share this. And we said, okay, let's, let's go ahead and share this. And there's so many barriers that patients and survivors go through already. Um, and just the tremendous change it makes in their lives that we felt we don't want to put up any other barriers for people to come and find some space that is helpful to them. So we wanted, we, we've never charged for the class. Um, we've always just felt that in our hearts, like it's just something we want to be and we want it to be here. Um, and so it just, the pro- program just really grew it was awesome. I mean, the, the feedback that we got, you know, every couple months, we'd have a couple more ladies come and ask, you know, when is this class? Can I come? Can I meet the instructor? And so from there, it just word of mouth grew. Um, we ended up, you know, trying to reach out to other places in Rochester, other medical facilities and letting them know that we do this. And, um, and so from there, um, we knew <clears throat> with the gal that we started working with, she's like, I know there's grants out there that can help support this program and help grow it so that we can, you know, keep this 
being, you know, a place in the community um, that she's found so helpful. And so we linked that into our nonprofit as well. So we had been pretty successful so far at getting um, at least one main grant a year um, to be able to um, buy separate equipment for the women that come because we know there's that, you know, we want to create a just a, an environment that they feel comfortable coming into. And so being able to kind of do mini retreats for them, um, connecting them to other resources in the community that might be helpful. So we've partnered with just other um, entities that also have some specialty in working with cancer patients um, for things like massage therapy and um, <clears throat> just, you know, good nutrition, other health things. And so um, it's been really fun to see that program grow. And I, I don't know numbers for sure. I know... I think in our Facebook group page, I've seen at least 25 ladies in there, um, you know, kind of ranges on how many people come to classes uh, based on where they're at in their treatment process. But um, we, before the pandemic kind of started, we were doing classes, um, I think we had two a week. Twice a week, yeah. Yeah. And then um, once we shut down, we were able to switch to Zoom. So those ladies were still either able to meet with our instructor via um uh, video chats and, and classes that way. And I'm trying to think our grant that we are able to get this year, we are able to buy them their own equipment to do it at home. Cause we know this will probably last. They won't maybe be able to come back Especially for a while. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So we want them to feel comfortable being able to still do their, um, classes at home and so, um, yeah, it's been really very rewarding, very touching. Um, I actually just went around and dropped off equipment to their houses over the weekend, masks and socially distanced and everything. Most of them, we were like, oh, we were talking from the car and from the front door and able to just chat and see how everybody was doing. And I mean, we have a range of ladies from mid thirties up until their eighties. So it's, a fantastic group of women that have connected with each other um, just through our classes. It's it's really makes me emotional most of the time and them just to kind of know that they have that space to be together. Yeah, and we've now, so our managers moved on, but now we have another manager in place. So we were through the grant money, we were able to get her trained as well. And now we have two more instructors that are going to go through some training in February. So we'll have, we'll be able to, to slowly grow um I mean I don't think it's going to be a program that will you know be everywhere in the community but at least we have a stol solid base here and you know if it can take off more than that great but if not we know we're reaching we're reaching people mm -hmm. and I that's what's important um so well yeah and when we first started researching this it was kind of a u unique thing in the country even it's not yeah. There's not a lot of... There was a lot when, can, like, cancer exercise specialists are growing as well right now. We've got a lot of people going for training, a lot of personal trainers to be able to help people because you want to be able to help them and do it the right way. Um, and now we're starting to see more yoga studios offering training specifically for cancer patients. It doesn't have to be breast cancer. It just that happens to be where our focus is right now. Um, but <clears throat> in general, just working with people you know, with any diagnosis um, of cancer and how do you do that? How do you make sure that person stays safe and comfortable and, and it's meeting their needs? So I know we have, there's a, at the Y, they have the Live Strong program. So and that works with all general patients um, and survivors of cancer. And it's with a more exercise focus um, where ours is, is really just in the yoga studio. Um, so it's really bringing that just for them. Um, whereas I know the Live Strong program is a little more generalized. Um, so, and that's a national program, I believe. So, yeah. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about COVID. So, <laughs> we shut down probably six to eight weeks in the spring, and now we're coming out now in the second quarter. What did we say on next? Four weeks next total. Saturday, it's a week from Monday, or we're I'm sorry, down. a week from Friday. Uh, three months. Three in, months <laughs> in the yeah. summer. Spring and summer. Yeah. We opened back up in June, mid-June, and then we were shut down again, um, 
the 18th of November or 20th of November, and now we can potentially reopen December 19th would be our planned yeah. reopening. So if That's we're able allowed. to open over the course of this year, we've been closed for four months. Yeah. <laughs> so a third of the year. <laughs> Well, we, props to throw out to our members and the people that just love being here. They have tried their absolute best to support us, whether it be to you know keep their membership active even while we are closed, um, purchasing stuff from us, um, gift cards, gift cards, yeah. telling their friends. <laughs> Um, you know, we're going to open again. So, hey, go buy a punch card from those guys. You'll be able to use it as soon as they're open. Um, so, I mean, we have probably one of the best community of people that love being here. And so it's a huge thank you to them because that's just, I mean, it's kept us going too. Like, we know that we're making a difference. We know that people like coming here. So that is the one thing that keeps me going the most because mm. I think that first shutdown was like, terror what oh my gosh what do we what do we do you know how do we navigate through this um so that's that's been really really nice to see yeah just seeing the nice side of response from the community makes you work that much harder to do everything you can to stick around and uh Mm -hmm. make it to the end of this thing whenever that is Mm -hmm. um but beyond that uh early on I, i you could kind of see that this was going to be a while. Um, and, you know, immediately going after federal programs uh, that were available at the time, you know, PPP, uh, the emergency uh, disaster assistance uh, grants. We, we applied for many, many grants. We received some of them, um, some local. Um, yeah. yeah, we got the Keep It Local grant on the second round. And we're actually working with Workshop in town. So he's doing a a redesign on our website, helping us with just social media, um, getting ourselves kind of out there and relevant and accessible for people to come back when they're ready and learn more about us. So that's been fantastic. Um, Yeah, and just really hunkering down as a business, you kind of look at, okay, where are our expenses? What can we hold back on for now? But well, how, even, do we, you know, yeah. how do we navigate? How do we keep our staff healthy? How do we keep our staff, um, you know, getting a paycheck? We have, what, 35 staff, most part-time. We have two other full-timers besides Jeremy and I. Um, the rest are part-time, but that doesn't mean that doesn't impact their lives to not work here because they love being here, but this, that's their secondary income that is important to a lot of our, our employees. So that was a huge factor in how do we stay helpful to them, you know, make it so that we can bounce back as quickly as possible um, so we can get everybody back in here and back working. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just realizing, you know, okay, we're, once we were able to open, you know, this is going to be a new normal for a while. um, But then also realizing, you know, this could go backwards at any time and it did so uh you know a lot of planning up until we had to close our doors again um it is a little tougher this time around because it seems like there's no assistance or help or anything Mm -hmm. so that's been challenging um it sounds like there is some things on the way though at state level no i think you're right there there's glimpses of support on the horizon but like how long that's going to yeah. Right, and then what the final actual version is, yeah. or how, there's how no helpful guaranteed. is it going to be? Yeah. Um, you know, is it a grant? Is it a loan? Um, what are the, you know, what are the fine print? You know, how can we use it? How is it going to be useful to us? Um, yeah, that's a whole whole big part of it. Yeah, we found actually when we were able to open back up, we came back to about like sixty percent of what the previous year was, which we felt good about. Being that we were only operating or allowed to operate at 25% 25 capacity. capacity. So we were doing, we were doing okay. Like for the circumstance, (laughs) we had people that were excited to be here, wanted to be here. 
wanted to support us, be in the gym. And, you know, I mean, they, like I was telling you earlier, they were great with all of our health and safety protocols. They were, they were knowing that we want to keep you guys open and we're, how do we do that? How do we help you? So, I, I mean, that was, that was fantastic to see that for a while. And, you know, trucking along with that was, okay, we're going to get through this. And then having the second closure was just kind of took your breath away again. You know, this is our busiest time of year. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is when it's the holidays. It's when we do some really good sales that help us in the slower months when we, you know, maybe don't have as much traffic. As soon as everyone knows in Minnesota, we get nice weather. Yeah, get outside. Mm-hmm. You got to enjoy it while you can. So we sometimes slow down a little bit when that happens. And so, you know, our, our winter and spring is important to us. Um, so that we can, you know, have a good year overall. So that was that was a a big <laughs> yeah. These, one to these four <laughs> week, <laughs> these four weeks, <clears throat> hopefully four weeks that we've been ordered to shut down is literally our biggest of our four weeks of the entire year. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is. <laughs> it's going to take a toll for sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you been, so you have yoga classes online now. Yep. Redoing some of the space with some yeah. art. Yeah, yeah, we've we definitely haven't just sat around and done nothing during the closure. Um, we made improvements in the gym, you know, projects that we had kind of were slowly working on. Um, this time around, we had one of our staff and one of our members who are artists in town. They wanted to give something back to the community while we were closed, and so they're painting a, mur- a mural. Um, on part of our gym wall. It's gonna look awesome. So they're trying to get that done before we can hopefully reopen so everyone can come back and enjoy something new, um, a gift to everybody. So so that's been really good. Um, we've been able to keep our, our other full-time staff working. Um, they're helping out with projects, helping out just the logistics of being closed in a business like this is tremendous behind the scenes, keeping track of memberships, issuing credits, trying to figure out which programs we had to shut down, how are we going to make those up? You know, how do we keep the Zoom classes running with yoga? How do you keep people engaged? It's it's mind-blowing. As much I've as had, you think, yeah. oh, we're closed, we can just kind I've of... I've had like, some people be like, oh, you're just you go on a vacation. No. Well, okay, first of all, you can't really go on vacation anywhere right now. No. Second of all, I feel like twice as busy as we normally are because you're having to deal with all the normal you know, tax compliance, all the bills, everything like that. And then on top of it, like Karen said, you know, all the stuff we had to cancel, how do we figure that out? Do we postpone things? Do we push things out? If we're going to be able to open or we don't know when exactly we're going to be able to open, uh, we issue, if people want credits to be able to do it in the future, if people want refunds, our, you know, our membership base, you know, do people want to stay active? Do they want to just, you know, we're doing a free freeze for everybody. Um, and so it's just it's almost double the work mm-hmm. when you're closing and then yeah. not knowing when you can open it's like how much can you plan and you, you plan for a lot of different scenarios and you know because you want to hit the ground running when you are able to open um to be able to you make up as much ground as you lost or as much as you can mm-hmm. and uh and just it's getting just, our staff back i mean getting people back in the gym and those you know, they're used to, you know, where, when they could work and, you know, what they would, what their duties were and to kind of pull that away and now have to try to plan as much as you can to get well, it going again. Well, and then COVID too, a lot of our part-timers, their lives have changed so much that, you know, some people aren't able to work what they used to or, you know, yeah, they're, they're furloughed or, they're, yeah, they're temporary laid off. Yeah. You know, some of our regular people that work the desk or, you know, have, other full-time jobs where they don't need the secondary job or can't work a secondary job anymore. So, mm-hmm. you know, you lose staff that way. I mean, they're still in the community, which is awesome, but you know, then finding and training people up to be able to work enough, uh, yeah. for what we need is, has been tough. And, and then we have so many programs with all of our, you know, climbing team youth stuff. And, youth, yeah. and uh, we run a lot of programs through community ed um, all those instructors teach a wide variety of different things and training people up to take, those places of the people that we lost, you know, it's, it's going to take a long time to rebuild that, that employee base that we had. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Final thoughts, I guess, is we just feel grateful 
Um, being business owners is one of the toughest things I've ever ventured into in my life. Um, coming from an academic background and taking that step into becoming an entrepreneur, which I don't even know if it feels weird to call myself that. <laughs> um, be a business owner has been, oh, so many highs, so many lows. Um, but that passion, that gratefulness, that seeing people enjoy what you created is, I think, what keeps me going even when I'm in tears or screaming or <laughs> going, what did we do? <laughs> um, so I'm just extremely grateful for the, the chance to be able to do this and be with my business partner and my <laughs> life partner. So, yeah. Yeah. Kind of same lines. I Although I've been self-employed since I was 18, so for me this is how I like life. I've always been satisfied with being able to call myself boss and I know I work hard and, and working for myself has always been rewarding. Um, but 22 years into being self-employed and um, to have, you know, uh, as, as bad as things are right now to really see how much you're appreciated by the community and uh, the effect you've had on people when what you're doing has been taken away. <laughs> Um, and how much outpouring of support and everything we had is, is probably the, one of the better moments in my business life, I guess. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had to come to this, but to, to see, <laughs> to see the, uh, the support from the community has been awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, we fully, you know, respect our place in the community. And from my background and just caring about everybody's safety and health. I mean, we are, we understand, you know, the sacrifices that we're making and having to, to shut down because we do, we very, really care about everyone's safety and being healthy and trying to get through this um, the best that we can. So I know it's, you just have a gamut of emotions, but we'll be okay. Everything's mm -hmm. gonna be okay. Um, we want people to know that, you know, they can find us on Facebook. We're trying Instagram. <laughs> we're doing our best with that medium. Um, like we said, we're going to roll out hopefully a new website pretty soon so people can can go to that to find all of the, the awesome things that we do here. Um, in the next two weeks, we'll still we'll have um, pro shop hours. So if people want to come in and still shop and even just come stop by the gym, we'll have pro shop hours on Fridays and Saturdays and um, we have our route setters that are, you know, trying to keep the gym ready and waiting to open up yeah. again. Um, but yeah, Fridays and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 2, we have some staff here that will be running the pro shop. Um, but yeah, once we reopen, we just hope people come back. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to connect again. Thanks so much to Karen and Jeremy for letting me come out to their space and record. You can definitely check them out at Roca Climbing and Fitness. They're right off 65th Street exit on 52. And you can find uh, more information about them and their website through the links in our show notes. So I just wanted to remind everybody as well of an upcoming entrepreneurial education course that we're offering through Collider. It's called Basics of Entrepreneurship from Idea to Customer. This is a live facilitated eight session program to help people considering starting a business and small business owners think deeply about their customers, identify their target market, and build their product or service in a customer-focused manner. And this program is for all businesses, not just high tech. The program will run for eight weeks. Educational material for the program was provided by an open source Creative Commons license from MIT, and the curriculum is based on the book Disciplined Entrepreneurship, 24 Steps to a Successful Startup. This is a live 
Live facilitated sessions will be held every Tuesday from January 12th through March 2nd, starting at 5 p.m., and it'll be held virtually using Zoom, so anyone can connect in from really anywhere. So the first half of each of these sessions will have a guest speaker, and the second half will allow for the participants to share progress, so kind of like a peer group, um, and they'll also gain feedback from each other and from the facilitators. So it's not really a didactic lecture-based class. It's more based by learning. It's more based on learning by doing. So if you have an idea, if you haven't been able to move forward on it for whatever reason, or if you're in the very early stages of business, definitely recommend it. Check it out. You can find out more at collider.mn slash B-O-E for basics of entrepreneurship. And I will put a link in our show notes to that as well. Thanks so much to everyone for tuning in to the podcast today. We always greatly appreciate if you like the podcast wherever you're listening in or if you rate the podcast. It helps more people find us. And please consider sharing this podcast with at least one person that you think would find some value from it. We'll be here next week with a brand new episode.